Stay free with Russell Brand. See it first on Rumble. Jeremy, what is the Mosul Orb? And tell us, is this a particularly significant sighting? Yeah, it's it's really significant that it was able to be seen by the public. So let me be very abundantly clear. There are these orbs, these spheres. You said Foo Fighters, which all the way back to World War II, you have these metallic spheres that are traversing our um, restricted or, or war zone or combat areas. And what happens is through all of these decades, none of them ever have come out from military film until now. I was able to obtain this image, which by the way, was from a classified briefing about UFOs or what they call UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena. That's the true definition now. And I was able to obtain it and release it. And this image is the first time the world is ever seeing one of these UAP from a conflict zone. Now, why is this important? People were laughing when I said it about a year ago until they start understanding that it's true which is that we sometimes shoot at these unknowns. We shoot at them, but not just us. We also know that Russia and Syria fire upon the same units, the same objects, which means it's not theirs. So whose is it? Now this image, the Mosul orb is from Northern Iraq. Luckily I was able to obtain it and, and release it, but here's the deal. It is from within a classified briefing. What was that classified briefing? That classified briefing, which was authored by a man named Jay Stratton, who, who ran the UFO programs for the United States for a while, he put it in there to educate pilots and aviators and our war fighters, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is one of those UFOs. You should and can report it. We're not going to call you cuckoo. We get it. We see it on radar. We want to know more about it because if we shoot at these, if we shoot at these in conflict zones and we don't know whose they are, we could misidentify and have a fight between two countries because we're shooting at UFOs. This happens on a daily basis. Our pilots are seeing these orbs. Now, they're also pyramid in shape. They're also cubes with spherical auras, which is reported by pilots. So what you're seeing is an image they don't want you to see. It's from a video. They don't want you to see it. So the Pentagon is sitting there right now like, hmm, what do I do? Jeremy just released an image. We know it is from a classified briefing. It is of a UFO and we've designated UFO and it's in a classified briefing. What do we do? Do we Are we honest to the public? That's what they're thinking. So right now, Susan Go, who's a woman who's the, the spokesperson at the Pentagon is trying to figure out what to say. And right now she says, I have nothing for you. I mean, she says that to mainstream media. She says that to independent journalists. Well, they do got something for you. They got a four second video that they can release to the American global public. So I'm pushing, I'm pushing, trying to put gasoline back onto this fire, make sure that they try to put out in the right way to the American and global public what this is. This is a UFO, man, straight up. They've made sure it's not a balloon. They made sure it's not a satellite. If you ever see the video, which I hope you do, it moves from the right side of your screen to the left. It is under intelligent control, and it is not ours. It is not China's. It is not Russia's. This is not a balloon. This is this is an intelligent controlled machine that is advanced, and we don't know who it's from. Jeremy, do you ever wonder what the philosophical and ideological impact will be of meaningful contact? Do you assume, as many experts in your field have over the last 50 years, that contact between non-terrestrial entities and deep state officials has been ongoing. I, some, I feel that in order to ensure that people appreciate how significant this story is, it's important to bring to the forefront that we're talking about something that will alter our perspective of reality. Our perspective of cosmology, geography, epistemology, our understanding of knowledge and history has to alter. If, if we've been in regular, continual contact with UFOs, all of this is, is, of course, speculative. How could it be otherwise? But the possibility that human evolution has been impacted, influenced, even directed. Some of those uh, theories about uh, the, that we're living in a simulation start to have a different kind of grounding. We'll start with this, Jeremy. How deep do you envisage this contact goes? You know, when you say the government, don't, the Pentagon don't want people to see the Mosul orb, 
What do you imagine is in those vast nowhere hangars? What do you imagine is the kind of contact they've had? What do you think Reagan meant when he said at the screening of Close Encounters, there's only a few people in the room that know how real this stuff is? How deep do you think the contact has gone? And do you think it influences events here? Right. So I don't need to believe, I don't have the luxury of, of disbelief about this. You know, it is my job to speak with people in different levels of government and the military and pilots. And, you know, look, man, I, I don't have the luxury of disbelief. I know for certain, and it has been proved to me beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we have full intact craft and machines that we have been trying to reverse engineer. And, and I'll just say it, man, these machines, they're not from here. Whoever built these appear to be a non-human intelligence. Now, where they're from, because the word extraterrestrial means just not from Earth, but but also the word alien. You know, what is alien? Alien is anything that, that is alien to us, right? So I know for certain that there have been limited comms or communications with whoever these builders, we'll just call them occupants or builders of these craft are. Now, are we being told the truth? when we've had these comms with these builders or occupants, right? And, and that, that I have no idea, how could I possibly know? But I do know that we have reverse engineering exploitation programs for non-terrestrial technology, and I have brought forward witnesses, I brought forward, forward witnesses publicly, as well as privately, I have brought witnesses forward. So, so within government, people know who they are, and I'll be bringing a lot more people forward that have actually worked on these technologies, verified, bonafide, no mystery. They've been part of these reverse engineering SAPs, special access programs. So look, man, it's happening. Now, what is the implication of this? And that's the huge question you just asked. You know, how could I possibly know? I know for me, I, I feel like I have a right to know, a need to know, and a, a personal duty to find out. But I also believe the global public has too. Look at it this way. If our universe, if the fabric of our reality, if the nature and the topography of what we understand to be real is vastly different than what we are being told, and that is known, that is known by certain parties from mathematics and physics and material science to just the idea that we are not alone in the universe, and not only that, but we have had contact for a long durational period. Maybe we can't trust those we've had contact with. That's a big deal. Now, the reason for the secrecy, dude, this is like so obvious once you really grasp it. It's so simple. This technology can be weaponized. We're talking about weapons of mass destruction. The actual propulsion system in these craft are gravitational. If anybody can catch up with the material science to making these materials, which you would need atomic layering in a zero gravity environment, if we were able to replicate that, Let's say China does. Let's say Russia does. All of a sudden, what happens is that country has an advantage beyond anything that has ever occurred in the history of humankind. So this is being taken very seriously by people within our Defense Department. I can attest to that personally, that I know that to be true. This is not a fringe topic. This is classified at the highest level of national security within your government, within my government. Now, we got some goodies and we're trying to work on them. But the big question is, how does it change humanity? How does it change the way that we interact with our family? How does it change the way that we prioritize our jobs, our work, what we do with our life? Once we learn that we are part of a bigger ecosystem, a cosmic ecosystem, and that distance and space and time is irrelevant to travel, it changes the way that we deal with fossil fuels. It changes the way that we deal with our basic understanding of interfacing through electronics and communications. It changes everything and it changes it now. We are slow to grow. That is true about humanity. We are slow to grow. But the thing is, we're smart, we're capable, and we do grow. It's time they open the books on the UFO topic. You know that if you change our understanding of Sort of, I don't know if you call it post-Newtonian physics, our understanding of distance, space, time, velocity, the way that this gravity-based propulsion system suggests that we could do, then I suppose you have to similarly examine 
the worldviews and philosophies that have grown out of the scarcity and limitation based ideals that are underrated by that like te the temporal ideology time is limited and linear you know although sort of obviously some of einstein or the theory of relativity challenges that that space is a sort of an absolute commodity <clears throat> but there are things in quantum physics that query that about sort of like objects traveling beyond the speed of light for example or you know the objects might not be right when you're talking about sort of quantum phenomena so it just seems that it seems then i wonder what it's it becomes difficult to envisage what the ideologies and philosophies of a species of beings that are able to operate at that level might be and suggest to me at least jeremy that they might regard us more like flora and fauna rather than peers that we'd be more we're in ant farm territory rather than you know shared members of some space council and i am reminded of the sort of thing neil degrasse tyson sort of said when he was on our show but i know he says it a lot it's pretty cool if we're two percent smart if, we, if the two percent difference between us and chimps represents all of culture as we understand it a two percent more advanced species than us would have just two percent would have access to ideas that we can't even conceive of i suppose that's why in our conversation we have to continually move between what's demonstrably true even though those aspects of this story are you know any area where you're not getting involved in speculation and conjecture is you why you have to be a little more disciplined in the conversation but i'm accustomed much like their machinery to move from the quantum realm to the cosmic realm to move between well if this is true then what does that mean if this is true what does that mean because that's what fascinates me i suppose your um relationship with bob lazar must be super significant to you because he's a person that's been in this space for a long time uh like some I suppose most people that are fans of our channel, members of our community will be familiar with him. But my understanding is that Bob Lazar was a, a sort of an independent engineer that was asked to work on some recovered technology and, uh, you know, and had to sign all the usual stuff that you might imagine and has subsequently gone on to speak at length. And there's a lot of, I've seen a very uh, successful video between you, with you and Rogan and Bob Lazar talking about like, you know, is he legit? Is he the real deal? and I know that you believe he is and I believe he is and I, I I wonder how significant his contribution is to this conversation and how his contribution alters with these recent spate of revelations sure so let's talk about Bob Lazar but I want to touch upon the first thing you said you know we're, we're living in a data rich environment but we're like data poor in the way that we, we we see it we look at it the scientific community even our friend Neil deGrasse Tyson has made statements where we realize oh man, they really got to catch up. They're not exposed to the data. I see Congress and Senate not having as good briefings as George Knapp and I do as journalists. And, and that's concerning. That's real concerning. So the first thing you talked about was what's the intent? You know, we an ant farm, you know, let's go real dark to real light. Then we'll get to Bob Lazar. The, the real dark is, look, man, when we got cattle, what do we do? Do we treat them uh, poorly from their perspective or do we feed them, give them water, make sure they're healthy with antibiotics? But they're a commodity to us. That's just the truth about, you know, meat industry here in the United States and beyond. So the dark version is, oh, man, yeah, they're taking real good care of us because we're some sort of commodity. Right. Then the other side, the lighter side is, hey, man, they've been here a long time. This is obviously some sort of reconnaissance program or some sort of thing where there is interest with human consciousness and these uh, you know, beings, these non-terrestrial beings that seem to uh, build and operate these craft. So it's kind of like pick your poison. Who you are will, will really reflect in your answer, right? It's like the evidence shows us that they've been here a long time. But how you answer what you think the intent is, it's all speculation. You know, we know UFOs are real. We know they're made by somebody, you know, not from here. But what they're doing here, it will reveal more about us than it will about them. Now, whatever that truth is, let's move on. Bob Lazar. For those of your audience who don't know who Bob Lazar is, I, I think the best way to learn about him is just watch the documentary I made on him because I tried to humanize him because he is a human, first of all. And second of all, because people would dismiss what Bob Lazar said by attacking who he is, by attacking his persona, his individualism. And that's a real mistake. That's actually a very dangerous mistake when, when you can't separate the message from the messenger, what it is that we know 
from what it is that we think. So Bob Lazar was tasked by the United States military in 1989 to reverse engineer a, a propulsion system that was non-terrestrial. It was from a spaceship. It was absolutely from a disk style spaceship. He called it the sport model. He had cute little nicknames for all of them. I have proved that he worked out at Area 51. I have talked to other employees that saw him go there and get off the bus and drive down to, to S4, which is the name of the building where he worked in on these non-terrestrial technologies. We had nine intact craft. This is fact, whether people want to believe it or not, it doesn't change the fact. You got to wrap your head around that reality ain't what it used to be. We now know it's true. So Bob Lazar is kind of like a whistleblower, except he did so because he was fearful for his life. Because at the time, and I see it up to this day, by the way, I see it up to this day. Witnesses that have come forward to me are threatened, and they are threatened by people that are within special groups within government. And we're not standing for that anymore. That's why Congress and Senate did this Whistleblower Protection Act. So how significant is Bob Lazar? And how does it relate to what we're seeing in the news? Bob Lazar is probably the most central, significant person when it comes to the public knowing about our government, our military, reverse engineering, alien spaceship from other worlds. That's Bob Lazar. That's what he did. And George Knapp brought him forward. Now, today, what we're seeing, man, George Knapp and I said, very beginning. When you see these shoot downs, the United States pops a balloon with a missile. By the way, they didn't even hit its center. It was down to the right. Whatever. When you see that on national TV, what are you really seeing? Those balloons have been around forever. If we really cared about secrecy within the United States, so no exploitation from China doing this kind of reconnaissance, we would worry about our cell phones much more than we're worrying about a floating balloon that we shoot with a missile on national television. And then, and then, we get all these other shoot downs. Oh, can't find the debris. I'll just tell you, these are not UFOs. These are balloons, and this is all theater. Everything you're seeing from the mass media is absolute theater, other than when I do uh, an interview with knowledge on like CNN or something, because I fight for that. I make sure the truth is being brought out. So Bob Lazar gave us the basics. And then from there now, you're seeing this kind of sleight of hand thing going, on the surface level, but underneath the surface, there are people very interested to hear from people like Bob Lazar, who know the names of the programs, who had hands-on experience, and who actually worked on these things unsuccessfully, because we don't have material science, but that is also happening in tandem right now, is good people, patriotic people, are trying to find out what's up with UFOs.